And Paul said this in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. So how many of us are willing to crucify the works of the flesh? Notice that it is hard work. It is serious hard work to allow the Lord to come and crucify that flesh so the spirit of, of the living God can arise and take full precedence. All right, we're here in another episode of In the Woods here at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. This time, I'm here with my homie, Keith Bowie. Hey, Ooh. Keith. Hey, Jorge. How are you, man? I'm good because I'm in the Blue Mountains of North Carolina. <laughs> Haven't been in North Carolina since the mid-80s. It's a long time. Yeah, it's a very long time. I haven't seen family since the mid '80s. So, who lives in North Carolina? So it's quite an a. Uh, it's been an experience I haven't felt in a long time. Ah, that sounds like Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, uh, a little a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Keith Bowie? Keith Bowie is a man. Whose birthday is tomorrow? Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, well, happy birthday, man. Uh, thank you. Uh, January eighteenth, uh, nineteen sixty-three. I was born, and Keith Bowie wanted to be an opera singer many years ago when he was five years old. Studied classical music, studied the languages, uh, until the Lord changed the direction of my life, which caused so much. Whew. So he interrupted your life. He interrupted my life. And it's been, it's been a crazy ride, to be honest with you. Because when God interrupts a person's life and moves them into an atmosphere of something they're not familiar with, and especially something what they don't want to do, but... The amazing thing about God is he will outweigh you. So I had to learn to submit and obey his beck and call. And it was a and it was a serious fight, to be honest with you. So did you become an opera singer? Oh, yeah. I uh, from grade school, middle school, high school, college, I performed in operas. I. Um, gave concerts, performed in concerts with orchestras, etc. I was enjoying myself. But once again, when God, or let's say when Jesus knocks and you open the door, uh, he won't leave. <laughs> I bet those were quite the years of entertaining, but also entertainment. Were they outside of uh, were they outside of Christ? Oh yeah, classical music, a hundred percent, is outside of Christ. But I, I and I, I'm going to be a little transparent. I somewhat maintain my Christianity, or God made it to the point where He did not let me go so far. My mother said this when I was growing up: He will only give you so much, so much rope to go so far before you really stray, stray. So I believe there's been a call on my life um, a long, long time ago, but I just wanted to be an opera singer. And it came to a day where the Lord said to me, he said, OK, I gave you what you want. Now it's my turn. And he and he made it very clear. I'm going to be closing doors. And I thought it was a joke, but no, the joke was on me. Um, I had roles that were lined up and I had other things that were falling into place for, for a career in classical music, but they all shut down. So it was heartbreaking. Here we are now. Yes. Uh, and what's been cool is that we have engaged in some, uh, missionary journeys together. We have embarked on missionary journeys together. Uh, yes. gone to Panama. 
Yes. Twice. Twice. In Guatemala. Yes. Which was, all of them were memorable. Right. Uh, life-changing, game-changing journeys or mission trips, right? Yes. But uh, the one that really stands out to me was Guatemala. Yes, 100%. I think the trip to Guatemala is the trip that broke my heart the most. Seeing how devastation, how people survive or how they're surviving such great devastation, great loss. And still to this day, the, the image I seen where they were digging up the bodies of the ones that were buried underneath. Um, the volcanic matter, pyro pyroclastic. Yes, the, yeah, the pyroclastic. It was heartbreaking to me. Because when I look at a dead body, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think of one major thing. Did they know the Christ? Did they know Jesus Christ? Did they go to a place in which that was not made for them, but was made for the devil and the fallen angels? And it just, it just ripped my heart, you know. So I'm crying out more and more so because of that trip to trip to uh, Guatemala, it's like, God, I need more souls. Now, um, I think actually on that video, I, your lower third, your identification there was Keith Bowie, <laughs> world traveler. <laughs> and, uh, you know, actually the newspaper in Quincy, Illinois, where I was living at at that time, and, right. uh, and you came right before we went on that trip, we got interviewed because they found out we were, you know, going to provide relief and aid to... Uh, you know, during post such a catastrophic event. Yes. And uh, when the article came out, it called you. Uh, it called you a nomad, <laughs> a missionary nomad, or something like that. Right. Right. I got a kick out of that. So, what countries have you been to? What countries have you had the, the privilege um, of traveling to and, and, and ministering? Uh, like Amanda, as she said, Panama, Guatemala, um, Japan. Uh, which is still one of my most favorite countries. You've been there I've been there times. maybe 14, 15 times. I'm really not sure. I did my little bit of ministering there. Um, and to Israel, I love Israel. And I've said this before and I say it again. Every believer should visit Israel at least once in their lifetime because it will open up the Bible to them not that the Bible is not alive, but what I'm saying is that what you already know about the Bible, it will open up even more so and give you a more in-depth understanding. It's been one of the most amazing experiences to be sent by God, to be, for the Lord to say to you, I need you to go to a certain place. And then when he doesn't give you a full understanding of why he is sending you, it's like, okay, Father, why am I going? And sometimes he just doesn't say anything. Obedience is the most important thing in the life of the believer. And as I quoted that verse in John chapter 14, I forget where, it's, where it lies. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me, obey my commandments. So, of course, I must say my one of my difficulties is obedience. Of course, not now, because I, I, I believe that I am well on my way of doing what the Lord even more so what he can trust me with because of my obedience. So that's what love is. You do what you're told. And sometimes don't even ask why you should do it. Do it because you know for a fact the Lord has told you. If we remain faithful to the things in which he has foreordained for us to do, to say, no matter what the cost, no matter what the, uh, what the situation is, we have to trust him. And I always say this, that's an old TV series called Father Knows Best. And so I've incorporated that into my own life. Mm. Father knows best. He knows what's best for me than I know for myself. I also know that part of your journey and, and, and some of the struggles and, and adversities you face had to uh, uh, 
that stem a lot from your childhood. I mean, you're you're one of ten <laughs> kids. <laughs> Dad was absent. Father was absent. He was there, but he was, uh, my father was a very quiet man. Um, I mean, he, when I understood the things what my father suffered and what he has gone through in his, his life, then I understood why he was the way he was, you know. Now, I also understand that you struggle with stuttering oh. in, in early childhood years. Oh, yeah. And uh, share with us how you overcame that. How I overcame that. I stuttered all the way up to the age of maybe 23. Uh, and it was so bad. My brothers and sisters, they still remember. And some of my older friends still remember how badly I stuttered. And how I overcame back in the 80s. I can say back in the 80s. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I... Uh, was going to, well, I was visiting this church in Newark, New Jersey. And the pastor at that time said to me, go to, I forget the pastor's name. Uh, he said, go to pastor such and such. And he used to stutter, have him pray for you. So when I went up, I asked him to pray for me. And he rebuked the stuttering. He rebuked the spirit or whatever it was. And and I still remember the month. It was in the month of May in which I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, actually. And as time progressed, the stuttering started to slowly disappear. So I saw him around the same time, the same uh, next year in the month of May. And I said, hit me again, preach, because I'm not stuttering the way I used to. And he prayed for me again. And as I sit today, I can literally hold a conversation uh, with anyone without stuttering. So by the grace of God, I'm no longer stuttering. I can articulate my words even more clearly, you know, and better. And I mean, it was brutal. I mean, it was a very brutal, uh, brutal year stuttering. I, I used to was mocked and laughed at and was told to shut up. Uh, <laughs> so it, it developed bitterness and resentment in my heart as I grew up because of it. And I ha and, and it was horrific, to be honest with you. But by gr by once again, by the grace of Almighty God, he had to heal the wounds in order for me to do what I am doing now. And he's still healing the wounds, still healing certain situations in my life. Well, again, uh, uh, I'm glad you're, that you're here. I'm glad that he's healed those wounds. And I'm, um, one of the things I'm, I'm going to ask a couple of hard questions, maybe not hard, but the, some of the, you know, the, uh, the real questions, right? Um, but before that, you know, interesting catch what we, what we had today. <laughs> <laughs> little birdie little birdie he's gone uh, <laughs> our, our nephew nick is quite the hunter he so uh those that watched episode one of in the woods saw that he he shot a squirrel and that was uh that was on the menu and then today on the menu is we're gonna have again, bird yeah little birdie we don't even know what species he is but he is a 22 uh uh and Shut it right out of a tree. So uh, having having a good time out here, man. Just uh, it's awesome. Decompressing and getting away. And um, so tell me, Keith, you you travel the world. You you've done ministry. You got a calling in your life. Where is the Western Church as we speak? Where do you see? All on me. Uh, okay. Where are we at? Where is it going? Um, what do you think? What What are you seeing in the spirit realm that? Uh, that the Lord may or may not be pleased with? Well, that's a very intense question, what you're asking. And sad to say, I am seeing the Western church developing, not all, thank God, but it's God always have a remnant. And as we know what the word remnant means, it means a tenth, a few. But the rest that's not part of that remnant, she's looking like the, La like the Laodicean church. She's rich and, and increased with goods, and she can do everything without God. 
And sad to say, that's what a lot of the churches are doing. They're doing a whole lot of things. They have a whole lot of ideas and they're not getting them from the Lord. So that means there's a lot of absence of prayer. There's a lot of absence of fastings. There's a lot of absence of true Bible studies. And how many of us are willing to pay the price in which Jesus said in, I think it's Luke chapter nine, starting at verse 23, he, Jesus said, he that come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And Paul said this in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. So how many of us are willing to crucify the works of the flesh? Notice that it is hard work. It is serious hard work to allow the Lord to come and crucify that flesh so the spirit of, of the living God can arise and take full precedence. So when I'm looking at the church today is in the Western churches, sad to say, does she really truly have the identity of Christ? No, I'm singing more entertainment. And I believe Leonard Ravenhill said this. He said, when there's an absence of the presence of God, there's nothing left but entertainment. And I just paraphrased what he said. And that is so true. So we're having all of these sparkling lights flashing all over the place like it's a nightclub. This is what I've seen with my little travels around the United States. We're seeing. I'm going to try my best not to be too harsh. I'm, I'm seeing these really simple Bible studies in which people are not being fed properly. It's something that is said in Hebrews chapter five, I think is verse 12. And I'm a paraphrase the verse. You should be eating meat, but you can only handle milk. So lukewarmness is what we're seeing in the majority of today's churches now. Uh, what would you, what counsel, encouragement, exhortation would you give to missionaries abroad, whether they're about to deploy and go on the mission field or for those that are considering, especially those that are already on the field? Remember why you are going. Remember why you believe the Lord is sending you to that nation. And remember who you are. There's something with one of my friends, her name is Polo, brilliant anthropologist, lover. I think she's brilliant. She taught me something about being an, being an ambassador. This is what she said. When ambassador... After two years, they go back home to remember who they are. Remember what nation they were born and to remember the place of their birth. When an ambassador loses his identity in that foreign nation, he needs to reconnect with his nation to remind him of who he is, where he was born, and why he was sent there. Not to be like the nation he's at, but to show that nation he is representing of his own nation. Unbelievable. Something to remember. Remember who you are. And as Apostle Paul said, we are ambassadors of Christ. Once we lose that vision of who we are in Christ, we need to go home and get reacquainted with the one we say we love.